the world is swept away. It's one of the reasons why we meditate. It's because someone like the Buddha found that there's something that doesn't get swept away, and it can be attained through human effort. As we were saying today, when he set out in his quest, he had no guarantee that there would be a deathless happiness, but he felt that he wouldn't be satisfied with anything less. A very strong sense of sangwega. You work, 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 gain pleasures, and then find them taken away. As the Buddha says, there's a passage where he talks about the drawbacks of sensuality. And one of them is that you work really hard, and either you don't gain anything, then say you're, you're a farmer and you plant your crop and it gets wiped out by forces beyond your control, or you do gain the crop that you want and you do gain the profit that you want, and they either get stolen or hateful heirs take it away. And that's material things. Then there are relationships. The Buddha compares the happiness that comes from relationships to borrowed goods. Your happiness, your sense of who you are, depends on someone else. They can take it away at any time. And so it was seeing this that the Buddha said, there's got to be something better. And we're fortunate that he did find that something better. We, of course, don't have 100% guarantee until we ourselves have found that within ourselves, but at least there's someone who offers the hope and sets out a path, gives us the opportunity of testing the path, seeing if it works. Fortunately, it doesn't save all of its rewards for the end. There's a lot of good to be gained as you practice, finding a sense of well-being inside. The mind can settle down and have a clear sense of solidity, security, a sense of nourishment that doesn't have to depend on other people, doesn't have to depend on situations outside being just this way or just that way. In other words, we're not depending on borrowed goods here. We're creating goods of our own. And John Lee has a nice comparison. He says, it's like you have a piece of land here, and if you cultivate it, it will give you all the food you need. But for most of us, we go out and look at other people's land, hope to cultivate something from what they've got or what they have to offer. And of course, you go planting crops in other people's fields. They can just take the crops, claim them as their own run off with them. You can think about the city of Ayutthaya. It was laid siege to. And it wasn't just a city. Inside the city walls they had farms, they had fields, they had orchards. And as a result they were able to withstand the siege for a long, long time. They could have probably withstood it if it hadn't been for some traders who opened the, the gates to the enemy at one point. And that's what we do as we try to look for our happiness outside. We're being traitors to our own best interests. So it's good to think about these things as you're getting the mind to settle down. It helps develop a sense of sangwega. And John Lee has a long, long description of the various topics you can contemplate to get the mind to settle down. And in each case, it's they're aimed at developing sangwega. He lists the breath as the last one in that particular list of concentration topics, advising you that you work with the topics that develop sangwega first, so you're chastened. realizing that if you're going to leave the breath, you're looking for trouble. Here's a good place to stay. Learn to appreciate it. 
That's what the pasada is for, realizing that not everything in the world is miserable and not everything gets swept away. Not everything is dependent on other people. You've got the potential here. Here is your land, here is your own land. Your own breath is perfectly your breath. No one else can sense it for you. No one else can move in and sense it instead of you. This is your territory. Make the most of it. The breath is in constant, but for the time being you don't focus on that. You focus instead on the fact that you can stay with the breath all the way in, all the way out. And it's the inconstancy of the mind that's the problem. It's with the breath for a bit, and then it changes its mind. Again, it's a traitor to itself, opens the gates, lets thoughts of past, future, sight, sound, smells, taste, tactile sensations, all that business of the world out there come flooding in. There's a passage where the Buddha talks about how when the mind gets into the first jhana, you stand at the edge of the world. which he defines as enticing sights, sounds, smells, tastes, tactile sensations. And for the time being, at least, you can be beyond their, their sway. You've got something better here. There's a sense of well-being that's called the pleasure of form, you know, the form of the body as you sense it from within. This is your property. This is your land. Cultivate it. What can you do with these four properties? Earth, wind, fire, water. When is it good to have a good, solid, heavy sense of concentration? When do you want a lighter sense of concentration? Familiarize yourself with this territory. This is where you can grow your own crops, and no one can take them away from you. And no one else has to know. That's one of the other dangers of having outside pleasures, is other people can see them. Another one of the Buddha's analogies is of a hawk that has a piece of meat, and other hawks and vultures and crows see it, and they're going to attack the first hawk. They want that meat, too. The pleasures of relationships, the pleasures that come from having material possessions, they're there for everybody to see. And other people decide, oh, I want that. A particular case, the Buddha says, if that first hawk doesn't let go of that little piece of meat, it's going to be suffering for a long time. So it's good to learn how to let go of those kinds of things. Focus instead on the, the good food you can grow. The Buddha compares the states of jhana to different kinds of food. The best, of course, is the fourth jhana, which he compares to honey and ghee good, rich food. But all the levels of concentration can be nourishing. You learn how to appreciate them. Don't go opening the gates to let other people come in and trample your crops. In other words, thoughts of sight, sound, smells, taste, tactile sensations outside, which of course includes people outside, material objects outside. This is how they all come in. Learn how to close off those gates. And even though the enemy may be laying siege to you all around, as long as you've got all the food and water and shelter you need inside, you're safe. This may not be the ultimate happiness or the ultimate in terms of what a human being can attain, but it's the path there. And in the meantime, you've got the nourishment that comes from developing this state of concentration inside. So appreciate it. Hang on to this. It's the way out.